Great. Well, thank you very much indeed for that great introduction. We're starting a couple of minutes early, which is either a sign that you guys are all incredibly impressed by the panel, or a sign that you're rather concerned about the economy and the next president, or a sign that you're just a bit cold and want to get in out from the outside <laughs> outdoor airs. But, um, I've been looking forward to this panel all week, because this is a session where we don't just discuss incredibly important themes. It's also a session where we all get to play being president for a, a, an hour. Because the panel's entitled Notes to the President, How Business Leaders Would Reinvigorate the Economy. Um, and the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to ask each of the panelists to tell us three key things that they would like the next president to do during the first 100 days when they're in the Oval Office, and one thing that they don't want them to do at any cost. Because I think we've had a lot of vague rhetoric, a lot of statements, a lot of angry um, attacks, but I want to get granular. I want to talk what exactly are the key policy ideas that we should be talking about today to create a better economy, better business climate, better place to be American. Um, we've got an amazing group of people to talk about that, very wide range of perspectives in the business world. Um, on my far left, your right, we've got Rosalind Brewer, who is the CEO and president of Sam's Club. Um, and that's very interesting because she doesn't just look at the retail world, she's working particularly with entrepreneurs and trying to get a sense of where, where they are in terms of what they want to see um, for making a more vibrant economy. Next to her, we've got Horacio Rodansky, who's CEO and president of Booz and Hamilton, of course, one of the founders. And you can clap if you like. Um, next to him, we've got David Rubenstein, who, a man who barely needs any introduction, one of the founding partners of Carlisle. Um, next to him, on my immediate left, your right, we've got Henry Cisneros, who's a founder of City View, um, a vibrant, not quite startup group, but certainly in the new economy. So good selection of people to talk about what the kind of steps we need to see from the president really are. But um, before I kick off the conversation and start by asking you um, what you'd like to see the next president do, I'm going to quickly ask the audience, just check you're all awake and listening, um, and just check what kind of president are we actually likely to be dealing with. I'm going to ask you, who do you expect to see sitting in the Oval Office next January? Not who you would, who you would like, but who do you expect to see? Hands up, who expects to see Hillary Clinton? <laughs> OK. Hands up, who expects to see Donald Trump? All right. Well, as you can hear from my accent, I am British, English. Um, I actually live in New York these days, but I spent the last two days over in London dealing with the fallout of Brexit and talking to friends there. And so the one thing I have learned in the last week is that the majority view is not always correct. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not when it comes to scary. not when it comes scary. not when it comes to predicting what's going to happen next, and not when you're sitting in a place like Aspen. But I'd like to start with Rosalind. Okay, from your perspective, working with Walmart, talking to entrepreneurs, imagine for the moment that you are sitting in the Oval Office with a president. Mm -hmm. What should she do next? Wow. See, that's a big thing. First of all, I'm really glad to be here, and I think this topic um, obviously is highly relevant. And uh, for the work that we do every day at our company, we always think about what does the consumer want? How does this reflect um, what the impact it would have on the average consumer? And for us, we think a lot about that consumer that's around that forty to fifty thousand dollar a year household. And in some of these discussions, um, and oftentimes they're underrepresented. So from that perspective, and then from the business perspective of the way the company that I run got started was to really support small businesses and entrepreneurs. And so um, I personally, as CEO of the company, think about that every day. So this question to me poses a few things. First of all, um, obviously, the support of small business growth in the United States. I think what entrepreneurs could do to the next coming of technology and innovation in this country is critical. And as we, uh, you know, really, uh, this long tail that we're seeing on this 2008 recession, we're seeing that the majority of the jobs that are being created, they're coming from very small companies. 
And we have to be you know, aware of that and understand what those small companies and entrepreneurs need, and they need funding. So first and foremost, support the growth of small businesses in the United States. The second one is some work that we do with US manufacturing. And it's really important for us to support within our country. And um, I can tell you, every time we raise a, a, a moniker inside our buildings and say locally grown, um, we get the, the, uh, the connection with our consumer. Uh, just this week, we held our uh, U.S. Uh, forum in our offices in Bentonville, and we asked entrepreneurs to come in. And I can tell you, you could barely get down the streets of Bentonville um, because this topic is so salient right now in this economy. The third thing I would tell you to do is to create better partnerships. Um, I think partnerships are important, partnerships with corporations, partnerships globally. And I think that we can't do the work uh, that the U.S. economy needs to regain itself um, on our own. So partnerships in, are important. So is there anything there you'd actually turn into a bill? Anything tangible? You know, I, I'd love to see, um, you know, a bill for entrepreneurs and uh, something that would support them with maybe, um, you know, alleviating some early taxation, maybe the first couple of years of their uh, starting their new startup, and then possibly s some way to actually bring funding directly to them because I think that's important. Right, okay. So a kind of hug an entrepreneur bill. Yes. Okay. That's right. Right. Well, I'll come back to some of those ideas in a minute, and I'll also come back and ask you what you don't want to see in a okay. second. Um, but next up, Horacio. Um, if you don't mind, I'll do only two. Uh, okay, first of all, I'm great. really happy to be here. I think streamlining uh, is a great is, um, advantage if you're president. Focus on the top things. Sounds great. And, and my focus is really on the tone that a president can set for the nation. Uh, and, and I come at it in two different ways. Um, I, I, was, I came to this country at the age of 19, and I came here. Where did you come from? Argentina. I was born and raised in Argentina. I came here to go to school. Right. And I stayed. And the reason I came here is because. You're now, now American. I am. Donald Trump, are you listening? An American. Uh, yes. <laughs> I get to stay either way, hopefully. Yes. Um, <laughs> my, you know, the, the reason that I came here is because I always looked at the United States as the country that did big things. The country that won World War II, the country that put a man on the moon, the country that broke all the barriers, the country that moved the world forward. And I would love for the next president to get us to dream big again to propose an ambitious, audacious goal during the term of an administration that can rally the entire business community and rally all of us in a bipartisan way behind it. And I don't really care if it is we're going to cure cancer in the next five years, we're going to put a person on Mars in the next five years, we're going to have a Marshall Plan for Education, we're going to have a, a complete redesign of our, in, of our cities and our infrastructure to put people and jobs closer together. There's lots of amazing things we as a country could accomplish if we are willing to dream big again. Uh, and the second one that is closer to my business, uh, a lot of our work is for the federal government. Um, I, I don't know if people in the audience know this, but about a third of the federal workforce becomes retirement eligible at the end of next year. A full Wait, 80... Say again, a third a, of the federal workforce... I think the precise number is 31% of the, of the federal workforce non-military, becomes retirement eligible at the end of government fiscal 2017. That's one way to cut the size of government, isn't it? Uh, not a good way, but it is a way. Mm. Uh, I mean, uh, more astonishing, quite astonishing. troubling, 85% of the SES level, the most senior level of government, is retirement eligible within the next five years. And those folks are either, the, the fact that you become retirement eligible doesn't mean you automatically retire. It means you have the option to do it. And the way in which over the last few years we have set a tone where a government worker is viewed as a bureaucrat that isn't contributing, as opposed to being viewed as a civil servant that is helping drive a government's agenda and the nation's agenda, is going to get all those people to go out the door. Right. I know a lot of people that are foregoing great income in the, in the private sector to fulfill a mission in the public sector. And I would like the next president to reaffirm that it is cool to be in the government again, give you one more statistic, 9% of the federal workforce is under 30 years old, compared to 23% in the private sector. There's a lot of work we need to do. I don't care if you like big government or small government. I don't think anybody wants ineffective government. And having a talented workforce is going to be a key, really, necessity of the next administration to pursue an aggressive agenda. Okay. 
So you want a policy to hug an entrepreneur, you want a policy to hug a civil servant, effectively. <laughs> um, what, if you are dreaming big, though, in terms of you know, trying to find an, an, an ambitious goal to really try and redefine the tone, um, which of those big projects would you prefer? I mean, do you think it's more important for business to have you know, infrastructure, all-out infrastructure, or education, or putting a man or a woman on Mars? I, I think that any one of those would capture the imagination and get us all going. I would love to come to work the day after and gather my leadership team around and say, how do we get our 23,000 people working towards that goal? And frankly, if I didn't do that, my 23,000 colleagues would just go do it on their own, which would be much more chaotic. I think we need something like that that will unify us and get us going again. Right. I must say, we're going to come back to this later on, but I do find the issue of infrastructure particularly interesting right now because it seems to me that the one thing that Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton both agree on is the need for a big wave of infrastructure spending. I mean, the language right now is, is, is fascinatingly similar. But what I would say about that, and I'll, I'll shut up, is I think fixing infrastructure will not capture anybody's imagination. I think really? redefining infrastructure, mm -hmm. I think talking about smart cities, talking about what the world could be like when we get connected transportation, when we get intelligent cities, when we get the, the urban experience redefined, that's the kind of stuff that I think would make us feel like, wow, let's go do something big together. Okay, so notes the president find a really thrilling new word for infrastructure. <laughs> you can say that. <laughs> well, rebuild America. That's, you know, there quite you literally, you know. Um, make America great again. Make America, <laughs> make America great again with cement. <laughs> but, um, David, now you've actually advised presidents coming in, haven't you? A number of them. Um, well, so none you... of them took my advice, so that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> the one that did manage to get inflation to 19% with my help. So, um, <laughs> so the first thing I would recommend, to the, depends who the president is, if it's a certain person, I would recommend resigning. Uh, <laughs> um, but, um, I would also recommend that the State of the Union address be given at the Aspen Ideas Festival. It's a much more uh, collegial place to have the State of the Union address. <laughs> and I would prohibit any discussion of Brexit for the first 100 days. Um, but on a more serious note, I would say that the most important thing the new president could do is to change the tone in Washington. Right now, it's very bitter, and it is not the kind of thing that the Founding Fathers really envisioned. We've had a lot of problems in our country, but the tone is terrible. How do you change that? The president has to be willing to spend the time to go spend uh, dinners, lunches, breakfasts, whatever it might be, with members of Congress. They still control the purse. They still really control the legislative process. And I think you have to put the time in to change the tone and be willing to compromise and not try to get everything you want and be willing to uh, upset, to some extent, some of your core constituents. You have enormous amount of time in the first six months, maybe a year, to do things. After the first six months and, good, and year, the goodwill goes away. So take advantage of that in the first six months and year, a year or so. Once you change the tone, then I would focus on uh, the uh, immigration reform because it's overdue. It's ridiculous. We don't have an immigration policy after all these years. Focus, of course, on infrastructure has already been talked about. Our bridges and toll roads and other things are falling apart. We are a third world country when it comes to uh, airports and cell phone connections. It's embarrassing. Um, when my cell phone always breaks down, and I talk to people, I call back and say, I'm in a third world city. I'm in New York City or I'm in Washington, D.C. And people <laughs> understand what I mean. Uh, the, the cell phone connections in Lagos, Nigeria are much better. And the roads in Lagos, Nigeria are much better than Washington, D.C. So we've got to fix that. We've also got to fix the tax reform, the tax code. Tax code hasn't been changed since 1986. And it's disgraceful that we have the inequities that we have, and also the system is just not working. I think the president also um, needs to appoint people who know something about economics and finance if you're going to have people that do something about it. So I fear that we're going to um, have too many politically correct people who don't have any background in this area and won't be able to uh, really be taken seriously by the markets and also get anything done. So I'd, I'd want a strong Secretary of Treasury. I'd re reappoint right away um, the, the, the Chairman of the Fed when her term is up and get that out of the way. Most importantly, what business people want 
is certainty. Just tell us, you know, business people are not that difficult to deal with. Just tell us what the rules of the game are, and we'll try to deal with them and live with them. But right now, there's so much uncertainty, regulatory uncertainty and other things. Uh, the Volcker Rule is a good example. It took almost four years to get the regulations for the Volcker Rule um, adopted. And so that uncertainty is not very good. So we want somebody who can, who, who, um, can give us some certainty, change the tone in Washington, give us some experienced people who know the financial and economic markets, and focus on tax reform, ta focus on immigration, and focus on infrastructure. And what I would not do um, is I wouldn't say I'm going to get everything done in 100 days. Uh, when Franklin Roosevelt came in, he had an unusual situation. Our situation isn't quite that dire now. So I would try to resist the temptation to say I'm going to do all these things in 100 days. Try to set a good tone in the first 100 days, and then try to spend a lot of your political capital in the first six months and one year and get the most difficult things started and hopefully some of them implemented, implemented and try to get a few victories in the first 60, 90, 100 days that are modest victories but show that you're getting something done and the tone of Washington paralysis has changed. Do you Well, let's hope you do get a chance to advise the next president. Um, but do you think it's actually helpful to draw up a list of two or three goals that you want to achieve well, I think in the first you know, 100 days? Or is that just uh, I think it's helpful if you have realistic expectations. In other words, you can't in 100 days uh, change the dynamic of Washington. But putting uh, the, the right steps forward and doing some things different. And, don't be afraid of being seen as the third Obama term or the third Clinton term, assuming Hillary Clinton is elected. Try to be the first Hillary Clinton term and, and do things that are different and make it clear you're not going to just uh, do things that were done before. You're going to make some changes and, and reflect the fact that you are a historic uh, figure. No woman's been elected president of the United States if she's the president of the United States. And, and try to take advantage of some of the um, goodwill you'll get from that. But also remember that the people who are against what you want in Congress, they're humans, and they want to be seen as politically uh, successful as well. They will compromise if you are willing to give some compromise yourself. You just can't be too dogmatic or you'll get nothing done. And I think too much uh, dogmatism in Washington right now is preventing us from having things like appropriation bills actually passed. We have to live with the debt limit problems all the time and run the risk of the, of the, uh, of the uh, our defaulting our debt. We should not have to ever worry about whether the federal debt is going to be honored or not. We shouldn't have to worry about whether the government's going to go bankrupt. And we've got to change the tone so that business people can feel, yes, we won't have to deal with these side issues that really make people very nervous about wanting to invest in the country. You want to get business people to say, I want to invest in this country more than I want to invest in any other country. There's staggering amounts of cash overseas. We've got to bring it back and find some... Uh, you know, reasonable way to bring it back so that money can be invested in this country and not uh, elsewhere. What I find very interesting is what all three of you so far have been talking about is as much about a change in tone and a change in tactics as it actually is about hardcore policy um, issues. I mean, none of you have said, I want a bill to say A, B, C, or D. It's really about the way the president conducts himself and interacts with the rest of the machinery of government, which is a very interesting shift. I realize I didn't actually get a chance to ask you two about what you wouldn't do. Perhaps I should ask you that, and then I'll turn to you, Henry. Sure. Well, then, what would you not do at all costs? So, you know, I, I uh, worry a lot about uh, consumption taxes. And, you know, it it's causes those households that I referred to earlier to really reduce their ability to save. And when that happens, you know, it only causes us to increase the cost of goods sold. And, you know, that cycle, it's, it's detrimental to a part of our society that doesn't get the focus that it needs. So I worry about increasing consumption taxes. So I would really try to, in this administration, avoid any increases in that area. Interesting. What about you? What would you? Um, I guess I'll have two things on this one. Okay. Uh, Absolutely You've got one, you've got one, not, one left anyway from the positives. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'll borrow the one that I didn't use. Uh, I would not wall off the United States from the rest of the world <laughs> under any circumstances. So no walls. No walls. Plenty of construction, but no walls. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I would not set up a private server in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so no walls and practice email hygiene. Yeah. Exactly. Those of you who couldn't hear, 
he would not set up any private email servers in the basement or anywhere else. So, um, exactly. What about you, Henry? Well, I think setting and the should, tone... By the way, I should have mentioned at the beginning, I'm sorry, I failed to mention that you were previously actually in the government, you were in the Clinton administration as right. a head of housing and urban development. So right. you've actually seen the limitations of power, but also you know what happens when somebody, a president or anyone else, gets actually into office and the things they can or cannot do in the first 100 days. So what's your list? First and, also, and also seen um, what happens in the transition period and also in, those, in that initial burst of energy uh, before the first State of the Union and so forth and, and, and the kind of deliberations that go on in the White House. Um, I would um, say that setting the tone is very important, but the tone is going to be viewed more with accomplishments. And so it is important to have discrete, measurable accomplishments early on. I favor strongly, and, and, and the three things that I would recommend, given the assignment of this panel, which was to focus on the economy, mm. would be three. First, um, the infrastructure uh, opportunity is huge. Um, we have this massive shortfall of $2 trillion. About $1.5 trillion of that is in transportation. We're short in water systems, witness what happened in Flint, but it's repeated in 5,000 other places with lead pipes in, in water systems. We have shortfalls in broadband has been suggested. Uh, power generation, we lose power in the, 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 the inadequacy of our distribution systems. So to me, that is absolutely job one. It's a no-brainer. Uh, Hillary Clinton has called for a $250 million infrastructure bank that can be offered right at the beginning it helps stimulate the economy, where growth rate is a little slow right now, and it also puts people to work. Unlike some of the others that Horacio mentioned, which are laudable objectives, dealing with cancer, for example, putting a person on Mars, we need to put people to work right now. And um, so uh, something that reaches out to the country and actually puts people to work in the process of stimulating the economy and dealing with a long-term good, which is increasing our competitiveness right. through our infrastructure is huge. To me, that's whoever, whoever's elected, whether it's Hillary or Trump, who, by the way, is a builder, and part of his definition of making America great again is to be a builder of the country. Absolutely. So as you said at the outset, there's already a kind of bi bipartisan sense. The Congress is ready to do something on this. We just haven't had the moment in, to, to act. And before I come to the other two, I'd just like to come in on that, because I spent time recently talking to some of the people are providing economic advice to Trump. And you know the vision they sketch out was very much that if Trump was in Oval Office, the first thing he would do is to gather people around to cut as many deals as he could in a bipartisan fashion. I say this is their vision, not necessarily Trump's vision, but their vision, um, and try to create a bipartisan national unity project around the issue of infrastructure. Uh, do you that. think that would be possible? I mean, you know, I know, I know, you know it's sort of not where the conversation's going right now, but can you imagine that working, David? And then I'll come back to the other two. Um, if the rhetoric in the campaign hadn't changed, I think it'd be difficult to get some of the Democrats to work as closely with him on a bipartisan thing at the beginning. On the other hand, um, if he's reaching out, um, you know, I'm sure the Democrats would listen. But infrastructure is like the weather. Everybody talks about it, nobody does anything about it. Everybody um, <laughs> has been talking about improving infrastructure for a dozen years, and the infrastructure has not gone anywhere. For example, uh, we have had gasoline prices at record lows for the last two or three years. The Congress have been afraid to impose a gasoline tax or any increase on in gasoline taxes. The money could have been used for infrastructure, but because we're afraid of increasing any taxes, nobody wants to run for election having increased taxes, we have missed this opportunity. I, I think we have to recognize that infrastructure is going to cost money. We're going to have to have higher taxes to pay for it, or we're going to borrow money, which is going to go against the federal debt. Well, we have to do one of those things, or the infrastructure in this country will be truly third world, and it's getting close to that. Or we're also going to find ways for the private sector to bring private capital to infrastructure, incentivizing the private sector to do things like help build broadband. We, we and, should. Uh, um, and I toll roads and airport. Uh, so there's, there's, there's work to be done in getting private capital unleashed for monetizing I, I infrastructure. Um, and of course, I, I, one, one interesting thing is that some of the states are now raising yes. taxes and using it locally, even if the federal government isn't. And the states are setting up public-private partnership laws to make 
to bring private capital to infrastructure. Why is it that we have talked about infrastructure for the last eight years or 10 years or 12 years and haven't done anything about it? It's because one party is afraid of increasing the federal debt, understandably, yes. and another party um, doesn't really want to um, impose the taxes or have higher taxes imposed uh, because they're probably going to be regressive in many ways. So there, there are problems, but we have to come together with some solution that's not going to please everybody. But if you need a leader who is going to take uh, political uh, f um, hits for doing so, but yep. unless you're willing to do this and take advantage of it in the first year or so, you're never going to get it done in the but second a, year. As you here's get what's mid changed. We have a leader, the G uh, person on the GOP ticket right now who doesn't appear to care about the debt and doesn't seem to be that fussed about the issue of... I don't care about repaying the debt. Um, <laughs> there, there, there will be a bipartisan moment where Republicans care about national competitiveness in the economy and how infrastructure plays in that world, and Democrats care about the jobs right. and the workers and the union jobs, and, and, there, and I believe we will see that occur. As Horacio said, we're also at a point of inflection where it's not just more infrastructure of the traditional kind, not just more lanes of freeway, et cetera, but it's smarter, newer technology app applied uh, techniques to do distributive power, mass transit, et cetera. So we're really at a point where this can be done, I the think. The US government only moves when there's crises. We need, a, unfortunately, a crisis. You need a bridge to collapse and people die, or a dam is going to have to burst and people die before happened. the U.S. Well, government. Haven't, haven't you read something. the news, David? I mean, yeah. the last last couple of years, I've been bridges collapsing all over the country. We have sixty-six thousand deficient bridges right now. The, right ma the man with 000. the data, man with the statistics. So quickly, the the final two, if I may. Yep. Uh, I would I would pick two other things that are related to the economy, but they bridge to the future. And frankly, we c they come out of learning from this campaign. One of them would be a real emphasis on worker training. People are being displaced by the new economy. That's part of the problem that we have uh, in terms of the disaffection that exists in the, in the country at large. The Bernie Sanders support, the Donald Trump support in places like Michigan and Pennsylvania related to people who have been displaced, locked out, have no, uh, not, 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 not feeling part of the new economy. So German or Scandinavian style programs to train workers, provide uh, apprenticeships, et cetera, I think would be very important in, those first, in that first burst. Thirdly, I would say, also related to the, to the economy and the recent campaign, is to do something about student debt, because the millennials are finding themselves disaffected by the fact that they're carrying this heavy debt. They cannot follow the normal process that has occurred for generations, which is get married, you know, uh, buy a home, uh, the, the, the debt is impinging on their decision making about life, and I think we can do a much better job on that school. So those are the three things I would do immediately to get things going. Clearly, change the tone, bring the opposite party in, and try to do these things together. The thing I wouldn't do is follow up on some of the rhetoric and promises of, the election, of this recent campaign, which are things like immediately repeal Obamacare, immediately repeal the Iran uh, transaction or the deal, uh, the nuclear deal, because I think they, they, they take us off course. The Obamacare in particular, while it's not perfect, has a start, and I think there may be some course corrections on Obamacare, but the wrong thing to do is to follow the advice of the candidates in, the, in, the, in this campaign who say, I would repeal it in the first, in the first day in, on, on the job. Right, right. Um, well, I'm going to just do a bit more experiment. I'm going to ask the audience to stop a moment and think, each of you. You've just had a long list of ideas put out there, policies put out there. And I'd like you to think, if you were choosing your top three, what would they be? And I'm just going to go and try and do a quick poll about what are the key priorities for you in the room. We've had lists like doing worker training, tax reform, infrastructure, bipartisan infrastructure, tackling student debt, having an entrepreneur bill, um, looking at you know, changing the tone around civil servants, immigration reform, um, and going to the moon or going to Mars or cancer. Um, which out of those, I'm curious, are top priorities for you in the room? Um, let's can start I, can with... I say a word yeah. before they vote? Uh, one... Uh, <laughs> that gives you more time to think. Immigration reform is hugely important and needs to be done, but probably can't be done right off the top. That's my guess. Right. Uh, and secondly, tax reform hugely important, needs to be done. The last time we tried to do it, it was a six-year proposition. So if you want to show some early victories, you have to pick things that you think are sufficiently bipartisan and, and bite-sized, as opposed to 
the, the you know, multiple year propositions that slow you down. That's, that's just my input on those. Right. Any of you want to campaign for your ideas? <laughs> <laughs> Before we take a vote, I this is democracy in action. <laughs> I'm interested to hear from the audience. Right. The reason I'm doing it like this is I want to get beyond the, bi you know, the two-party two mudslinging, the vague rhetoric. I'm curious about you know, what are the specific policy goals that really matter to people right now. So let me just try a show of a vote. Um, that one's so keen they want to vote already. Um, and then I will come to the audience and, and uh, you know, bring you in for questions and comments. First of all, OK, who thinks that our infrastructure should be a, one of the top three priorities? Okay, we all care about those bridges falling down. Um, who thinks that student debt should be one of the top three priorities? Okay, not so much. Who thinks that immigration reform should be a top three priority? Okay, so that's pretty, and um, this is very unscientific. Um, <laughs> you have any hanging chads or anything like that here. I won't give you a 48, 52% result. Who, wants, who thinks that tax reform should be top? Okay, that's infrastructure, immigration, and tax. Okay, what about an entrepre entrepreneurship bill? Okay, a, um, a, a, a measures to make people value civil servants more. Okay, most of you probably haven't worked in government. Um, and what about, what about something, a big national project, like put the man on the moon, go to Mars, fix cancer? Send okay. the president to the moon. Sorry? Worker training. Oh, yeah, sorry, worker training. <laughs> okay. The president to right. the moon. <laughs> All right, that's about, what about sending the president to the moon? <laughs> okay. or, you can, or you can send them to Brussels. We'll take them. Um, okay, what about worker training? Okay, that's, so I say, in about fourth place. Maybe we should have put education reform there as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Education reform? Yeah, we put that together. Okay, so the top ones are, is there anything I've missed from that, the list? No. So strong, I would say this. Okay, well, we're going to get you guys in this in a moment. Job creation, okay. Um, job creation, kind of infrastructure, but okay. Well, listen, in a second, you will all get a chance to put up your own top three. This session may go on until the evening, but anyway. <laughs> um, but let me, I mean, looking very quickly around the room, immigration, sorry, um, infrastructure, I would say, is the most popular one of all. My personal bet is that's going to be a key aspect of whatever comes next, because it's the one thing that everyone can agree to agree on. Um, immigration reform, tax reform, and then worker training, education, appears to be high on the list as well. Um, any comments before we get to the many comments from the audience? Yeah. Okay, good, right. Good choices, good list. Good list. Okay. Well, the president, I hope you're listening. We have exactly half an hour to try and hear from the audience about what they think. Um, we have microphones in the audience. I would ask you all to say a couple of things. Firstly, it would be courteous but not compulsory to identify yourself, point one. Secondly, if you want to direct your comment or question at a particular member of the panel, please do so. And thirdly, and I'm going to be very, very strict on this, because right now I'm president in the room, um, <laughs> make it short and make it polite. And if you go on for too long, I will cut you off. So um, we have a comment in the back. Yes, good morning. My name is Jorge Benitez, and I have a question uh, to the panel. All of the things that you've talked about are things that affect us as a country here. You didn't talk about national security or homeland security. I wonder if you could talk about, talk about where that is a priority. Well, Anyone like I, to? I think yeah. the, the, the reason is because the panel is in the, quote, improving on capitalism block of the conference. And so the, the, the tilt from the outset was to focus on the economy and things we would do related to the economy. Am I not correct? Yes, absolutely. So that, that I think, speaks to why climate change or or international interconnections is not you know, in that top priority. They clearly would be in any list of the things a president would do, but the tilt here was toward things that stimulate the economy in the short run, I think. Yes. Yeah. So we got a question, question there. Uh, see. Francis Najafi, uh, we missed discussing two very fundamental issues. One is that about a third of our high school kids are dropping out, and the other third are not college qualified. Most are coming from minorities and uh, most likely end up in jail and become criminal. That's number one issue. Number two is we've been discussing throughout this whole session, globalization, technology, essentially 
uh, uh, doing away with the people who are not joining the new economy and not educated. And the very, pheno very phenomena, uh, Donald Trump phenomena is, is really the issue that we need to be discussing, which is you know, uneducated white male voters that are essentially are not retrained to be re-engaged. So I don't see any of the proposals, number one, what are we gonna do with that class of people? And number two, how are we gonna deal with our crisis in education that is not dealing with our minorities that are becoming majority in our country? Right. Okay, well, the answer, my answer would be, we were trying to address um, some short-term things the next president might be able to do to show some progress on the economy. But if you're gonna talk about a longer-term period of time, no doubt that the income inequality and the lack of social mobility is the most important uh, long-term issue the country has to face because we have an underclass in our society now and it's getting worse and worse. Um, for example, you're correct, in economic, on your statistics on that, um, high school dropouts in the city I live in, Washington, D.C., 25% of the people enter the ninth grade uh, do not graduate. And when you don't graduate from high school, you have a higher chance of having very low income, higher chance of being part of the criminal justice system, uh, in, 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 it's hard to believe, but in our country right now, 12% of adults are functionally illiterate. They can barely read their name. And you can't get a very good job, and therefore you're going to increase this income inequality. So the next president has to address income inequality, the lack of social mobility. And income equality is different. When you have a low, you're low on the income inequality scale, and you might have a chance to rise up, and many of us have done that in our, in our we all came from more modest backgrounds, and now we're able to afford to come here. But Many people have given up on the idea that they can rise up. And if you have an underclass that doesn't think they can rise up, you have a society that is basically going to be uh, killing itself. It's not going to be able to be a one united country. And that, I think, is the longest, or the longer term issue that's the most serious one the president has to face is how do we get the society to feel that it's cohesive and that you have a chance at the bottom to rise to the top. And if we don't address that issue in the next four years, I think the country is going to be in a much worse situation four years and eight years and 12 years from now. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I, if anyone in wants a knowledge to, economy, yeah. education inequality and income inequality go hand in hand. Uh, and if you, uh, there's a study, and I, I probably will misquote it, that says that by the age of four, if you come from middle class background as opposed to you come from uh, a household below the poverty line, you know four times as many words. Uh, that's by the age of four. So think about how that gap expands throughout your life. I was at, a, at a, an event where the CEO of the major manufacturing companies in the U.S. said that they have to reject 50% of the high school graduates that apply for a job because they cannot read at an eighth grade level. Wow. That wow. is which throwing, part? Which part of the country was that in? Uh, uh, this is a, a Midwest. Um, well, the U.S. military is now dropping the idea of having to be a high school graduate to get into the military. US that is a national. Oh, no. so it's it's 50% of our youth are being shunted aside. In, in a knowledge economy. And I think that's why when I talk about dreaming big, we need a Marshall Plan for Education. We really need to get at this in a fundamental way because income inequality cannot be solved without education equality. And then just one last point on that. I was able to be on a panel earlier this week talking about the cost of higher education. And we have got to figure out a different way to train and educate because this cost of higher ed will never um, offset what happens in K through 12. You can't fill in that gap with us, not everybody can do that $60,000 a year times four um, in order to fill in the gap of what K through 12 is not delivering. So there has to be something that comes in between that. And I think that is a very important part of our discussion beyond the 90 day point. The challenge to answer this gentleman's point uh, of picking education as one of those highest priorities, it clearly is essential to the country, important to act on, is that Unlike the other things we've been talking about that the president can start and influence and act on, education is very, very decentralized across the country. Local school districts, big important role for the states, and very small role for the Department of Education. So the, the federal government can set some standards, it can f fund some, some money through the Department of Education, but fundamentally the president's role here is to mobilize school districts, and state plans across the country. So it's a little bit different than the others that we've been talking about. It is, it is surprising that we have, uh, for a developed market uh, economy, one of the worst K-12 systems that you can see. Uh, but from, from the higher education, we have the envy of the world. 
we have been able to produce private and public universities that are the envy of the world, and more people want to come here to school for higher education than anyplace else. But nobody wants to come here for K-12 education in our public schools, and that's because they're not really attracting uh, very talented uh, teachers compared to what they should get. They're not paying teachers very much, and the students, I think, are really not uh, being incented properly by their parents and, and really their guardians to really make sure that they actually get a good education. It's a sad situation, and it's going to take years and, and decades before we change it. The second part of the gentleman's point had to do with worker training and, and uh, retraining and um, creating uh, training for the technical positions that people uh, would not ordinarily get through college. In other words, there's a whole stream of people who probably are not going to go to college and yet are not ready for the new economy. And that, was, that, that is something that can be done relatively straightforwardly and, and quickly through the Department of Labor, Department of Education. Yeah, I must say, having looked at this in some detail, there's so many things you could do right now to make short training courses more flexible, right. to change college accreditation, to change the funding of this kind of accreditation. I mean, that's something very tangible. It's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Right, we've got so many hands going up. Um, whereabouts is the, is the microphone? Up there, okay. The question is on job creation, which I think blends all of this together, because whether the causes, and, and how the panel feels about this, whether the causes are globalization or technology and whether the solutions are education, job retraining, and infrastructure, mm -hmm. it seems to me that the most disaffecting part of the country today is they don't have jobs or they don't have jobs at the levels that they want to have jobs and income. So that's the question of, is job creation. That's part of the purpose of pushing a massive infrastructure program because it's a big, big source of jobs. The economy is you know, in the doldrums at 2% or so flat compared to what a recovery ought to be. And, uh, and, and you're right, job creation is a big part of that. Oh, got, okay, I'm going to try and get as many of you as I can. I mean, um, so one, two, and then three. Then we'll go. Uh, Nancy Lazar. There could be uh, tax reform done quickly. There already is a proposal, Simpson Bowles, which was just totally thrown away by, by Washington. 80% of the people in this country work for small, medium-sized businesses, but they pay a 40% type tax rate. Large businesses only pay 20, roughly 20, 25%. Simpson Bulls would fix that. It would lower the rate for those small, medium-sized businesses. Yet large companies don't want Simpson Bulls because they would lose their deductions. Why can't Washington fight large businesses and push through Simpson Bulls? It's already written. It could be implemented relatively quickly and would create jobs. So should we have the... Plug and, play tax, plug and play tax reform package that we could already use. Who wants to vote for Simpson Bowles here? Well, Simpson Bowles, I think, it was a very good set of proposals. Uh, the president, for a lot of political reasons, didn't meet with the Simpson Bowles uh, commission afterwards because there was a lot of political uh, angst about what, what was recommended there. And when the president didn't really get behind Simpson Bowles, uh, for better or worse, uh, um, it, it didn't really get very far. I think the proposals uh, should be looked at again. But you know, the next president, appoint your own Simpson Bowles Commission, meet with the Simpson Bowles Commission, or the equivalent of it, and, and try to get some of these things implemented. Um, I, I think the Simpson Bowles ideas that were mostly focused, not mostly, but largely the idea was they're actually reducing the debt of the United States. And uh, that is not our principal problem now. It's a problem that we have to deal with for sure. But I think getting the economy stimulated again, as we just heard, you know, after recessions, you typically grow 3 to 4% a year at some point afterwards. We've not grown at 3% a year since the Great Recession ended. And no developed market country is. So we've got to grow at 3 or 4%. The best way to solve our, our economic inequality problems to some extent is growing at 3 and 4% or 5% a year if possible. And we have to stimulate the economy. Infrastructure is the quickest way to stimulate the economy. But I, I fear that since we haven't had a, a real economic slowdown, quote, recession for seven years or so, you know, the next, the con next year you could see a real slowdown in the economy again, and we don't have um, interest rates that we can lower very much, so you're going to need fiscal policy, and it's going to have to be some kind of stimulus that's significant. Infrastructure is one, but it's only one kind of stimulus that we're going to be able to, we need to be able to use, and the next president has to be prepared for an economic slowdown and to stimulate that economy uh, in, in meaningful ways. Any of you like to adopt Simpson Bowles? Simpson Bowles was not a tax reform plan. Simpson Bowles was a debt reduction plan, and, and it, it, was, it was a fiscal plan. It had, taxes it had some yeah. tax provisions, but the tax code is, it's a thousand pages, and it is everything from philanthropy to the mortgage interest deduction to charity, et cetera, that is going to have to be addressed. 
So the effort to undertake tax reform is a huge and more complex effort. And these, these things are all countervailing one against the other. It, it has to be done, and we have to get started. And there is some appetite for starting, but it probably isn't the kind of thing you do right at the beginning of an administration. But one of the, the biggest issues that has been dealt with uh, and, and ignored is we have the $2 trillion of cash overseas that corporations have. Why don't they bring it back? Well, they want to bring it back at a lower tax rate. And we've been unable to figure out a way to do that, in part because the budget of the United States assumes the money is coming back at 35%. And therefore, all of our budget numbers assume and deficit numbers assume it's coming back at 35%. It's never going to come back at that rate. We should recognize that we have very big deficits in the out years and let the money come back uh, at a lower rate, provided the money is used to create jobs and some mechanism is, is established to make sure the money is used in some sensible way to create jobs. Yeah. I must say, my, my hunch is that that may possibly be another area of bipartisan agreement or action. It's the most visible source of capital to stimulate the economy without increasing the deficit uh, or increasing taxes uh, on, on average people. It's to let that money come back at a lower tax rate, provided that it's used in some measurable way to create new jobs and investments in the United States. That's the, most, that's the biggest possible uh, source of capital. Yeah, well, if you're looking for bipartisan agreement, agreement, that's another point you take. Right. We have a question in the front there, and then the gentleman in the, in the pink. I think um, the woman with the orange, Spotting. then the pink. Thank you. Shelley Porges, Washington, D.C., and co-founder of Entrepreneurs for Hillary. Um, we have great private sector leadership sitting here on the stage. What can the private sector do, what can private sector leadership do to not only advise the president, but actually help move this ball forward on some of the critical issues that you've identified? I'll start uh, with, that, uh, with that question. So I, one of the things that I think we all recognize from you know, this current administration is that when ideas and plans came from the administration, there was no phase in period, no early integration of a discussion with the private sector. It was decide, announce, and go. And I do think that there is something that could happen to bridge us together and get on the onset because, you know, for companies that are represented here, you know, we affect millions of employees. So the training that we do, the wages we try to apply to these associates, the, the, the benefits packages, they're sort of blind in other areas, but it's us who are down in the details and watching how these people work and live every day that we've got to bridge that. And I, I will tell you that um, you know, our company tries to have, we do have those conversations, and there has been some listening on, on that part and some influence. But I do think in this next administration that needs to go to the next level because it needs, it's going to end up here, so the discussion should start here. I think the next president should not demonize business. To some extent, we've demonized business as if, um, you know, we, we, we are creating jobs and we are employing lots of people. That's where the wealth of the country is coming from. It's really coming from business. Uh, so I think the next president needs to meet with business leaders, small uh, business leaders, entrepreneurs, and big business leaders as well, and not treat them as if they are from some foreign planet and they have to go out the back door of the White House because they're afraid to be seen coming out the front door because the president doesn't want to be seen with meeting, meeting with business people. Business people are Americans, and they want the same things that all of us want, and we shouldn't demonize them. And I think entrepreneurs are really the, the heartblood of our economy, and I think the president should recognize that. But meeting with business people and meeting with labor and other people is important. I don't think we've had enough of that in, re in recent years. I think, and I think we David said that earlier. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, no. uh, David said that earlier. The enemy of business is not necessarily regulation; it's uncertainty. And if we had a more clear agenda, a more certain agenda to be prosecuted over an administration, it'd be a heck of a lot easier for all of us to get behind it and figure out how to play a role. Right. And I would say there needs to be some uh, thinking on business uh, with respect to its obligations to the country at large. Um, we need a, an era of of, of business statesmen like uh, we had in the 1960s, R.J. Miller of, of, of Cummings Engine and people like Lodrick Cook and, and Robert Anderson who helped create the Aspen Institute, big vision people, Robert McNamara who went in the Kennedy administration and then to the Ford Foundation, big picture people who are not uh, you know, prone to the short-termism that characterizes most of business today, necessarily, that's the way we've structured our economy, but there needs to be some greater latitude, some broader thinking about the role of business. It is the top job producer, critically important to the future of the, of the country, 
and we just need a different kind of dialogue between business and government and I think today. the government also needs to have some figures who relate to the economy, who um, understand the economy, and really are, are, are listened to. In other words, we, it, it's helpful to have secretaries of uh, Treasury and, and other positions, commerce, who um, really convene business people, and the current ones do, but also when they speak, the business world really listens. And I think we got to find figures who can do that. So are you volunteering yourself? I don't think anybody in private equity is going to be invited into any administration. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK, I'm going to take a question here and then there, and then I'm going to go towards the back. So I'm trying to, we've got about 15 minutes left. I'm trying to get as many of you in as I can. I know that you all want to be president and have your say, but I'll get as many as I can. I, uh, my name is David Fuente, and um, the issue that I'm concerned about is entitlement reform. And while it certainly is a longer term issue, it seems to me that, it, that the risk of not, uh, not uh, uh, engaging in entitlement reform is substantial. The vast majority of private enterprises, be they business or other, have long ago shifted from defined benefit programs to defined contribution programs, uh, be they medical or be they, uh, right. uh, be they uh, uh, pension. If there's a Nixon to China opportunity for the next president of the United States, that is it. Um, because taking on the entitlement uh, interest is difficult, and, and I think the next president of the United States should say to herself, perhaps, my highest priority is not getting reelected. Um, and I'll, you don't say that you want to be a lame duck, but recognize you're going to do certain things that might keep you from getting reelected. And probably the Nixon to China moment that would probably most help the country over the long term is dealing with the entitlement issue, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, among other things. And that would take a lot of political... Um, uh, clout uh, from the president to do that, but I think that's probably what she should do if she's going to deal with our long-term issues. The entitlement issues that have everything to do with budget and, and, and deficit debt issues. Uh, since the end of World War II, we've averaged about 35% budget to GDP. It's now running at 70%, going to 100%, and going to 120%, driven mostly by the entitlement questions you mentioned specifically costs associated with, with, it's not Social Security so much as it is Medicaid and Medicare. The costs of, of a society that is aging, living longer, having medical costs for that period of time. So those are absolutely critical things that have to be done. They're very hard to do. Raising the age of Social Security, for example, means asking people to work for a longer span of time, some of them in manual labor jobs that simply cannot work into their late 60s, for example. Uh, so they're very, very difficult questions, but we do have to do what we can. And, and there are, including Simpson Bowles, strategies for dealing with entitlements that are difficult, but prove it can be done. We can get those deficit numbers down. Right. There's no magic. There, right, right um, sir. I see you, you were one of the people who voted saying that you thought that Trump would be the next president. So I'm particularly keen to get you to have your... You know, if we could predict the future, we could become weathermen. Yeah. <laughs> Great point. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, my name is Robert Potter. I'm an immigrant from Mayor Cisneros, San Antonio, to Dallas. And <laughs> I, I would like to respond with a, a big idea. And my big idea is to find a new way to store electricity and com combine the e efforts of the government and private industry, just like Manhattan Project and Apollo. And I want to address energy for a moment. Oh, the energy here is coming from Niagara Falls or, or a nuclear power plant or a coal plant. The efforts to build alternate energy do not address the core problem. They're very incremental, and they, would, they too have no way to start. If we could store electricity better, there are two major applications, and I don't want to call it a battery. There are five kinds of batteries, and these electric cars have these giant batteries. Okay. And your question right. is? I think your program, call it Power Project. Manhattan Project created more jobs than the entire auto industry. Apollo created tens of thousands of jobs. If the president said, I want a new way to store electricity, you would launch a major project right. with all the okay. spin-offs. Can you repeat that question? <laughs> right. Okay. All right. So the question, okay, I'm going I'm to intervene here. No, he's right. Exactly. He's, he's completely right, so which is we should have mentioned in the initiatives that we discussed a national alternative energy strategy. It has multiple benefits. It creates jobs. 
Right. It uh, deals with the energy uh, dependence that we have on other parts of the world. We introduce new forms of energy creation, and very importantly, we make a contribution in climate change as well, one of the people, great pressing problems. How many of people have electric cars here? Okay, who has electric cars here? How many people want electric cars? <laughs> Two? <Please>. Yeah. <laughs> Not many. Okay. All right. You have an electric, electric car, David? I have a 20-year-old car that uh, is very, very um, uh, inefficient, and I should get an electric car, but um, I'm not that good a driver, so I'm, I'm not sure they would sell me an electric car so easily. But. Right. Okay. Um, I'll take some more questions, actually, on this side. I'm trying to be balanced in terms of sort of, you know, right and left of the room. Mm -hmm. and I'll come back, again. back to education reform, uh, to what extent are there... Um, partnerships between industry and uh, the educational establishment, particularly in the training of teachers. It seems to me that the training of teachers would upgrade the entire system without getting into local issues. I, I am, I'm not uh, familiar with any programs that are involved with training of the teachers. There are many programs that are investing in schools and educational infrastructures that teachers may benefit from, but direct from private to the <coughs> teachers. I'm not familiar with any of those. There may, be, there may not be industry and teacher training, but there are people in the private sector investing heavily in teacher training, like the Broad Foundation, for example. Eli Broad that gives the prize for the best school district in the country and focuses on uh, principal's academies and superintendent's academies and increasingly uh, on, on teacher training as well. And on this topic, Ross, you made the point before that the, the current four-year college system is unaffordable long term and I completely agree with that and that is something where the public sector and the private sector could easily collaborate bringing technology to way, create ways to rethink it. I mean, there are some interesting examples of companies that are already doing that. I mean, you know, Siemens and others are actually trying to do some interesting innovative training schemes and personally, I'm a great believer when it comes to policy, plagiarize as much as you can. Right. And right now, Germany, Switzerland offer some really interesting examples of how to revise technical training. We were amazed. Back in 2010, we introduced a program with American Public University and thought that, you know, maybe a few of our associates would get involved. But now it's one of, um, we, it, it, it provides our associates to take the training that they've learned by working in our stores over the years and it accounts to college credit. So they enter um, a four-year program in their sophomore year, and then the cost of the program is 20% cheaper than any university in the United States, and the graduation rate is, is very high, and then we then provide them extended opportunities because of their advanced degree. But that came out of you know, a lot of our partnerships in the industry, and a lot of the NGOs helped us think through that and, and, and uh, really forge those relationships. But we do need more of that. All right, we got some questions right at the back. And we've only got a few minutes left, guys, so I apologize in advance for all of you who can't um, speak. Uh, real quick, um, I, you know, tone and message matters, and one of the most important things the executive branch can do is, is set a tone and, and a message. Um, do you think a President Hillary can actually reverse sort of the negative uh, anti-business tone that, that this previous administration has had? Do you think that turnaround can happen in sort of the first part of a President Hillary term? Great question. Well, I, I don't want to accept the premise that the current administration was anti-business. I think uh, sometimes uh, some of the rhetoric early on might not have been as helpful, but I think the administration did the best it could in trying to reach out to the business community. I'd say that the president can set the tone, and I, I don't think that Hillary Clinton needs to be seen as anti-business. I don't think she is. I think that you can set the tone by inviting business people in and actually listening to them. And I think she can change the tone, but the most important tone that has to be changed is with respect to Congress, in my view. Um, Congress is really the most important thing that she has to worry about, in my view, if she's president, because I think if she can't get Congress to change their tone with respect to the president, I don't think she'll get much uh, done, and I think her administration will be seen as lame duck from the beginning. And I think you can work with the Republicans in Congress. Not everybody uh, is going to listen to her, but I think she can make a difference if she's willing to invite them to lunches and dinners and, and, and take them to Camp David and, and play miniature golf with them if she doesn't play regular <laughs> golf. Do something <laughs> that will um, engage them and make them let down their guard and 
many members of Congress are not happy with the current state of affairs, um, and, and they would like to see some opportunity to change it, but they need to have somebody who is going to and it'll be more welcoming uh, and, and trying to change the tone. It's late in this administration to change the tone very much, and I think people are looking past the current administration. I think the, 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 the problem you cite is correct, but I think putting the focus on the president having to change that tone is just not fair. Uh, when Mitch McConnell said at the beginning of the Obama administration that they were going to do everything they could to make sure he was a failed president, and they did, um, it's not just the president who can change that. They have, the, the Republicans in, in, in this situation had goals, they had uh, plans, they had strategies for undermining the administration at every turn that they could. And uh, it, it, so the change has to happen in the bipartisan climate, in the way we, 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 we kind of un undertake the dialogue and the role that the Republicans choose to play. Um, people have criticized President Obama for saying, well, he didn't invite him over for a meal or he didn't have sufficient conversations with them. He did. But when they start with the premise that their objective is to make him a failed president, a one-term president, then you, you know, where do you go with that? So it's a much bigger problem than just what the president can do alone, although I think Hillary Clinton will probably be better at least trying to do that if, the way President uh, Bill Clinton did. That's right. just their nature. That's their DNA. Right. Sadly, um, before we get too party political, Sadly, we are pretty much out of time. Sad, very sadly, because frankly, I think this, this debate could easily carry on for another hour. Um, but I mean, it's been a fascinating debate. For my part, I take away th uh, three big conclusions. Um, firstly, that there are a lot of pragmatic policy measures which people agree on which could actually be implemented. And right. even though we disagree about which particular three you choose, there are a lot of very practical... Um, policy measures, and I hope in the next few months the candidates talk more about that than just talk about rhetoric and mudslinging. Um, secondly, there's a clear consensus that we need a change of tone on whoever comes in in terms of dealing with the business community and dealing with the rest of Congress and hugging the entrepreneurs, hugging the civil servants. Tone really matters. Um, and thirdly, what strikes me is that you in the audience and on the stage certainly do appear to coalesce around the need for infrastructure. The only problem is that we need a really exciting word for infrastructure. So whoever can think of one and find a tweetable tag for infrastructure, you will be the president. So thank you all very much indeed. Good to meet you. Thank you.